What's up, you guys? Welcome back to another Top 10 Commander video. This time it is for the new set Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. Gonna go over my picks for the Top 10 Best Cards in the whole set, and including some of the Commander cards from the adjacent Commander product. This set is a bit messy, it's a bit all over the place. Not strong in one strategy alone, like you're not going to see a ton of ninjutsu and that be the focus of the set. It's not even the case with vehicles, you get a lot of different weird strategies here. You have equipment creatures, you have shrines, you have enchantment focus in general. The set feels more, if anything, like a love letter to those who were waiting a long time for the return to Kamigawa. Wizards, I believe, did a pretty good job of bringing back strategies from the past and adding some depth to those returning strategies. And you're going to see that here. But before I get into the top 10, first, I would like to remind you, if you have not already, please do subscribe to the channel. We're at 31,000. Thank you all so much. It means a lot. Number 10, we have Spirit Sisters Call. This is a five mana white and black enchantment with at the beginning of your end step, you choose target permanent card in your graveyard. You may sacrifice a permanent that shares a card type with the chosen card. If you do, you return the chosen card from your graveyard to the battlefield and it gains. If this permanent would leave the battlefield, exile it instead of putting it anywhere else. In the immediate comparison here, just thinking about all of the cards I've played in the past, it is Debtor's Knell. Debtor's Knell for seven mana was a lot to spend to have to wait for at the beginning of your upkeep to get this trigger made it a pretty easy card to replace it's just not efficient anymore as commander grew as a format we started getting better reanimation we started getting better ways of recovering spirit sisters call is a similar card however it's pretty much all upside if there's one trade-off, it's that the permanents you bring back would eventually become exiled, so that is a little inconvenient. However, you are able to bring back permanents. You just have to sacrifice a permanent that shares a card type with that chosen card. I think that's great for aristocrat decks, it's great for graveyard decks in general, it's great for token decks because you're sacrificing tokens. It is number 10 though because I think that downside might be too much for some people to overlook, but anytime you can bring back permanents in general and have that flexibility, it's not just creatures like it was with Debtor's Knell, you have something special here that definitely deserves to see play in Commander decks. And number 9 we have the only Planeswalker on this list, Kaito Shizuki. I reward innovation, I reward brand new strategies, and I reward whenever we see an addition to an existing strategy. And Kaito satisfies all of that. We have a three mana blue black a legendary planeswalker with at the beginning of your end step if Kaito entered the battlefield this turn he phases out which is pretty crazy. The plus one draws you a card then you discard a card unless you attack this turn. I love that. Very aggressive. Minus two you create a one one blue ninja creature token with this creature can't be blocked so you know exactly where this guy's going. And the alt is you get an emblem with whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player. You search your library for a blue or black creature card and put it onto the battlefield. If there's a downside here, it's that the alt is going to take some time to get to. It's only three loyalty and the plus only adds one. However, he does phase out, making him pretty difficult to deal with immediately. If you're playing more of an aggressive ninjutsu deck, this is perfect. If you were to play a Planeswalker at all in any of those decks, this would be the one to do it. You actually get ninjas off the minus two. And a quick shout out to the other Planeswalkers in the set. Overall, I think we got some solid ones. It was very close between Kaito and Tezzeret. Tezzeret, as usual, just offers nothing but strength for artifact strategies. But the Wandering Emperor is interesting. It's a Flash Planeswalker and Tamiyo gives us something brand new as well with the Phyrexian hybrid mana. And number eight, we have Ghost Shintai of Life's Origin. Now, I was corrected in a previous video in discussing the best of Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. Shrine is not a creature sub subtype. However, it's the only subtype for this creature, so you could understand how I would be confused, meaning this creature does not have a type at all. It's just no type. Somehow Wizards of the Coast decided that was better than just allowing them to borrow subtypes, but here we are. That aside, Goshintai of Life's Origin does give us something we've been asking for for a long time, an actual five color legendary shrine commander option. Shrines are pretty strong if you have the numbers. That was always a problem for a long time because we only had five of them from the original Kamigawa. But ever since then, up to this point, we got like 17. So, <laughs> it's a little bit easier. 
And no doubt with this commander option, you're going to be able to enable all of your shrines with those colorless shrine enchantment creature tokens. I guess they don't have creature types either. But the more of those you have, the more triggers you get off of your shrines. And oh yeah, that five mana activated ability where you get to return an enchantment card from your graveyard to the battlefield will help to ease the pain of losing one of your 17 shrines. Number seven is Satoru Umizawa. I've also spent a video talking about Satoru Umizawa's ability. Giving each creature card in your hand in Jutsu makes this a different commander option than something that was popular in the past like Kiriko the Tiger Shadow. She had commander in Jutsu, that's awesome. Satoru essentially makes everything else a ninja. Not literally a ninja, but with the ninjutsu ability, I mean. So you can have massive Eldrazi if you want to. Give them ninjutsu, it's only four mana. So you can make getting out bigger creatures like Jingataxius a breeze. I like it because it's not the typical way that Wizards designs cards. Sometimes they'll just give you a marginally better version of the same type of commander that maybe does something slightly different. The way you build around Satoru is going to be different by a much greater margin, so you're going to be playing other creatures. You're not going to be reliant on ninjas. So he's going to be a very fun commander to build around. People are going to be interested in building around this human ninja. And then number six, we have the return of the Miyajin, but I'm only choosing one, Miyajin of Grim Betrayal. This eight mana legendary spirit is going to be costly, however, it's worth it. Enters with an indestructible counter on it if you cast it from your hand, that is typical of the Miyajin. They make terrible commander options for that reason. You remove the indestructible counter from Miyajin of Grim Betrayal to put onto the battlefield under your control all creature cards in all graveyards that were put there from anywhere this turn. This is the big play Miyajin. Out of all of the Miyajin that we see, this one offers you probably the best chance of winning the game. All you have to do is just leave this out on the field. Following turn, you play a board wipe that destroys all creatures. You remove that counter and bring all of the creatures back, not just your own, but your opponent's. If I had to say there was a close one, it would probably be Miyajin of Cryptic Dreams. That is the one where you get to remove the Divinity Counter to copy target permanent spell you control three times. So if you play a creature spell, you play an artifact, an enchantment, you can remove the Divinity Counter to copy that spell three times. I think that's powerful as well. And it's not that the other ones aren't powerful, it's just you're spending a lot of mana, you want the power. And then number five, we have Ishin, Two Heavens is one, another commander option I've talked about before in depth. But like with Satoru Umizawa, it is very attractive in its ability. I would say even more so because it offers us something we've never really had before, or at least in addition to Wolfgar from Adventures in the Forgotten Realms, and that is getting an additional trigger for attack triggers. We've had a ton of strategies centered around triggers like ETB triggers, death triggers. It was only a matter of time before we got something similar for attack triggers. White and red especially, they love combat, so you're going to find a ton of creatures like Sun Titan, Itali, Primal Storm. You're even going to have specialty ones like Brutal Horde Chief where you have that cool ability. That's what people like in commander options. They like when there's something brand new that they can build around, and they're going to feel confident building around it because they also recognize there are a ton of these triggers out there. And then number four, we have Jin Gitaxius Progress Tyrant. The return of this Praetor might seem a little underwhelming in that you're not cutting down your opponent's max hand size to zero, and you're not offering yourself a ton of card draw at the same time. We do not have Flash this time around, however. We have abilities here that are equally annoying. Whenever you cast an artifact, instant, or sorcery spell, you copy that spell. That ability only triggers once each turn, so you gotta be careful about that. Whenever an opponent casts an artifact, instant, or sorcery spell, you counter that spell and that ability triggers once each turn as well. So that is insane, that second trigger especially. It makes it so your opponents have to burn through more spells in order to build up a board presence. The combination of these two abilities, as is the case with every Praetor, offers you the overwhelming one-sided advantage. And like I said, Jingataxius Court Augur was impressive. If you get to draw seven cards each one of your end steps, while also making it so your opponents have to empty their hand, it'll probably win you the game quicker. But I like what they're doing here with the Praetors. We saw the return of Vorinclex already a year ago back in Kaldheim. And while that Vorinclex was nowhere near as strong as the previous Vorinclex and the ability to shut down your opponents, it still is powerful but in a slightly different way. So overall, I think this is a solid Praetor, and with the inclusion of Tamiyo's Phyrexian mana, I think we can expect to see the return of the other Praetor 
Raiders as well here soon. And number three is Junji the Midnight Sky. Now, as was the case with the Miyajin, we also have a new cycle of Dragon Spirits. All of the Dragon Spirits offer you a death trigger. The difference between the Dragon Spirits of the original Kamigawa and the Dragon Spirits this time is that you have the different modes. You have two different modes to choose from when each of these dragons die. I'm choosing Junji because you have probably the strongest two modes. I mean, both of these are beneficial no matter what you want to build around. Each opponent discarding two cards and losing two life is ridiculous. We have a ton of strong payoffs in the format for that, like Liliana's Caress and Waste Knot. And that second mode is really why I love Junji. If the best part about all of these dragons is that they have great death triggers, you're gonna want to synergize with bringing creatures back, because that means you're going to have more power for aristocrat strategies. So you put target non-dragon creature card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control and lose two life. Let me just ask you this, what would you rather have? A likely one-time use out of these other dragons? because with the exception of white, you're probably not going to have a ton of easy ways of bringing back green creatures, red creatures, or blue creatures. Not saying you couldn't, it's just going to be a lot easier in black. And while there is a non-dragon condition to bringing back creatures, you're able to bring back a creature from a graveyard, meaning you can steal creature cards from your opponent's graveyards. I love this, and it's just like before, Kokosho was a strong dragon, arguably the best dragon of that cycle. Junji's looking like the best out of these dragons. And then number two we have from the Commander list. This is a card you can pull in the packs, Ruthless Technomancer. Four mana, black human wizard, a 2-4. When it enters the battlefield, you may sacrifice another creature you control. If you do, create a number of treasure tokens equal to that creature's power. And it has an activated ability of 3 mana and sacrifice axe artifacts to return target creature card with power X or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. X can't be zero. <laughs> this is pretty powerful. If you're a fan of Disciple of Bolas, just go ahead and treat this like the mana version of Disciple of Bolas, only you have even more things you can do. I mean, the first trigger there, you sacrifice a creature, you get treasure tokens, helps you pay the cost for that second ability. So you could potentially sacrifice the creature and then bring it back with that second ability if you really wanted to. There are a ton of ways of abusing this, and I think most decks in black are going to want it. We just talked about great death triggers with Junji. This is what we want to pair that up with. You sacrifice Junji, you're going to get a ton of value. There's also a fun synergy with Anala that you could do with Disciple of Bolas. Feel free to do that with Ruthless Technomancer. Overall, because you're getting treasure tokens, it's going to synergize with a ton of strategies. And anytime you get this type of value, it's not overly specific to any strategy, and I think that's what people appreciate the most. When they look to add cards to all of their decks, they look for something like this. They look for something that's incredibly flexible. This is going to see play in a lot of black decks. Before I go on to number one, we have some honorable mentions here. Mirror Box is cool. I don't think it's strong though. I think it's a neat card if you want to fool around with the legend rule, making it so that it doesn't apply. You can copy your commander options. We have Light Paws. I've also talked about this commander option in depth. Very strong. You're able to search up a ton of auras. One thing holding it back is that it's going to be mono white in Voltron, which everyone's played. We have Shishiro, the Shattered Blade, which is another great option. Also focused on auras, equipments, maybe even plus one plus one counters, because you get plus one plus one counters on each modified creature you control at the beginning of your end step. You also have some token strategy there that you can benefit from. And I can't go the video without mentioning the equipment creatures. We have the Reality Chip and Lizard Blades. I think these two are the strongest of the bunch. The Reality Chip just lets you play cards off the top of your library, which is never a bad thing. And Lizard Blades, I mean, come on, that's just giving Double Strike to creatures, having Double Strike itself when it's a creature. Double Strike is a go-to keyword. It makes Commander damage a joke. This will see play. And we have the Return of the Vehicle strategy too. I can't go the video without mentioning that. However, I don't think anything new is being introduced outside of the Commander product. So we have Katori Pilot Prodigy. This will no doubt make building a commander deck around vehicles a lot easier than it's ever been. So number one, we have Besiju who endures. I love how simplistic this card is, but how useful it's going to be. It's a channel land. It's one of the five channel lands that we receive in Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. However, it is different from other utility lands that we've seen forever, and that it doesn't enter the battlefield tapped, which is a huge upside. 
The channel ability is going to act a little bit like cycling where you just discard it in order to activate that ability. You're only really paying one or two mana to do this. You destroy a target artifact, an enchantment, or a non-basic land in opponent controls, and that player may search their library for a land card with a basic land type so they could get like a dual land, and then they put it onto the battlefield. That's worth it though. This saves you a spot for removal spells if you were previously playing a card for its ability to destroy artifacts, enchantments, or non-basic lands. Well, you could potentially replace that card and replace a land so that you have room for something else. That's what I love about this. Now, obviously, we're going to mention the other four, which I don't think are anywhere near as useful. If there's a second best one, I would say it's Takanuma Abandoned Mire. With that one, you get to mill three cards and then return a creature or planeswalker card from your graveyard to your hand. That's pretty cool. That's going to synergize with a lot of decks, no doubt. But it just seems like those other three are a bit more geared towards standard. This one is probably going to see commander play more than anything else. If you're playing a green deck at all, I would strongly consider it. It's also a legendary land, so you could easily search it up with something like Saisei. That's not easy to do with instants and sorcery, so you have to admit, it is pretty useful. I think it's going to see play, no doubt. It's not going to be a burden on your decks because it comes into play untapped at the very least. So anyway, let me know what you think about the top 10 best cards from Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. Let me know what your favorite cards are in the comment section below. Commander Void here signing off. I will see you all next time.